We are going to do a little um, trivia tonight. Kayla says it's the homeschool mom coming out in me. I can't do things normally. I want to have a little fun. So um, if you get the question right, you're going to get a hug. No, a nugget, not a hug. And I got the kind that I like, which is I just like the straight milk chocolate. I do like almonds now, but the nuggets, man, these things... And I didn't even eat one because there's 27 questions and there's only 28 pieces of candy in here. So I restrained myself. We were cutting it close. Are y'all ready? I didn't say we were going to do all of them. I just want to be prepared. Y'all know I like to be prepared. All right. Peter's original name was Simon. Who gave him the name Peter? Oh, wait. No. Guys, you guys are going to have to jump up. And Craig and Lance, you guys are going to have to help me out. So this is a moving trivia. Who gave Simon the name Peter? Nadine. Very good. That was an easy one. Okay. What was Simon's profession when he encountered Jesus for the first time? Jump up. Well, Rosemary's my co-teacher in preschool. I've got to take it easier on her. A, f a fisherman. All right, Simon Peter originally ran a fishing business in the same town where he was born on Lake Gennesaret. What was the name of the town? Watch. Okay, it was Bethsaida. What was the name of Simon's brother who was fishing with him when Jesus called upon them to leave their work and follow him? Who originally, it was Andrew. You had to shout the answer out. Did you know who it was? <laughs> okay, try again. Who originally introduced Simon Peter to Christ? Try it. Yes. Come on. Be interactive. Who, what was his name? Good. Okay. Who? Oh. Peter had a brother who was also an apostle. What was his brother's name? If ten people don't jump up to get this. Simon Peter's Andrew. brother, Andrew became part of the inner circle of Jesus but there was another disciple who came from Peter's hometown which one just one well I don't know okay can you name all the disciples <laughs> Philip wait a minute Tag on it. I got that app. I'm going to use it. <laughs> Philip. Okay, what was the name of the servant of the high priest whose ear Peter chopped off as Jesus was being arrested? Dave. I thought y'all would be really excited and like jumping up. It must be, y'all must, must have slept too long. Why did Peter begin to sink into the water even after Jesus had called him out to walk on it? Nadine. Yeah. 
which member of Simon Peter's family had a fever that was cured by Christ? Where and what region was Jesus and Peter when the Father had the startling revelation that Jesus is the Messiah? Caesarea Philippi, people. <laughs> what? No, I did not hear you. After Christ's death, which act by St. Peter distinguished him as leader of the twelve? After Christ's death, what act by Peter distinguished him as leader of the twelve? He named the new disciple, Matthias, the replacement of Judas. Uh, Acts 2, 14 through 41, Acts 4, 5 through 21, Acts 1, 15 through 26. Get me with me later and I'll give you those answers. What was the name of the man who had been bedridden for eight years? What, what was blah, 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 healed by Peter and, and Lida? No. Who hasn't gotten a piece of candy yet? Okay, Roy. <laughs> it was Aeneas. I didn't know it either, but hey, I'm doing the questions, so. How many times is Simon Peter's name mentioned in the New Testament? Ninety-five. Good try, Roy. <laughs> Where, according to Christian tradition, was St. Peter's final resting place? Yes. Okay. Where is the famous church known as St. Peter's Basilica located? <laughs> what? Yeah, it's the Vatican. <laughs> In the Gospel of John, after Jesus has, has resurrected and shown himself to the apostles, what is Peter's reaction? <laughs> Rosemary looks so serious. In the Gospel of John, after Jesus has resurrected and shown himself to the apostles, what is Peter's reaction? He goes fishing. <laughs> okay. What is the Aramaic equivalent of the name Peter? This is arguably the actual name that Christ may have given him. Woo! Oh, sorry. Man, I hope I don't injure anybody throwing out these pieces of candy. According to Christian tradition and belief, Simon Peter was arrested in Rome and eventually sentenced to death. How was the sentence carried out? Jacob. Yes, he was. Why was Paul overtly critical of Peter when the two of them met in Antioch? That is correct. Peter withdrew from the Gentiles when there were Jews around. Holy cow! Look at that! That is one amazing arm. Jesus just touched my hand. After Peter's stirring at Pentecost about how many people were immediately baptized. Holy Toledo, 3,000. Peter has a, this is the word they use, a funky vision in Acts 10. What does he see? That's it. Yes. I was bragging. Oh, man. At the Council of Jerusalem, as mentioned in Acts 15, who gets the final word of decision on the topic of circumcision of the Gentiles? It's Peter. <laughs> uh, 
What kind of spirit does Peter teach that wives should have in 1 Peter, which is uh, in 1 Peter 3, which is what displays the unfading beauty of their inner self? Gentle and quiet. What was the name of the girl who greeted Peter at Mary's house when he miraculous, miraculously escaped from prison after being arrested by King Herod during the Feast of Unleavened Bread? I'll give you a hint. Her name's close to mine. Rhoda. <laughs> when Peter interpreted the words of David in the Psalms that Judas Iscariot, Judas's betrayer, should be replaced, what was the name of the man who became the twelfth disciple in his place? Okay, well that was just an easy piece of chocolate. John could have gotten that one. Hey, you guys did great. Well, I meant because he wasn't in here. He, he and Steve were counting money. Did you get here's a piece of chocolate? Who else didn't get a piece? Gabe, did you get one? Come on. Gotta be sweet. Anybody on this side? Any losers over here? You guys are being dishonest. Craig didn't get one. Steve didn't get one. Here, I know y'all. <laughs> All right. You guys don't have to fill these out if you don't want to, but if I just made them just in case. It's just a little outline. If you want to take notes, you can. If you don't want to, that's fine too. I was getting ready tonight and I took my Bible out of the Bible cover because it's a little bit easier to manipulate without it. Oh, and I found this beautiful little card from my friend that passed away in January. It's dated 2-14-2000 to Rhonda Roy, Samuel and Kayla, Loving Christ, Terry J, J Jr. and Tyler. She gave it to me on Valentine's Day. She was my cheerleader. She always encouraged me. And uh, it was just like the Lord was saying, you know, smiling down on me and saying, it'll be fine. Everything's going to be fine tonight. No, I wasn't really nervous tonight. But um, it's great to know that the Lord thinks about little things like that, about whether or not you're nervous or confident. And I could see Terry right now. She's saying, Oh, Rhonda, you're going to do great. That's just how she was. She was truly a cheerleader. I could never be like that, but all right. So we're talking about Peter the leader tonight. And we'll go through some of this stuff. And, and you, like I say, you can fill it out if you want to. If you don't want to, that's okay. Um, his name, he was born Simon Bar Jonah. And his nickname was Cephas. And if you don't get all the answers and you want to write them in afterwards, I can give you a copy of this. You're more than welcome to it. And his, his date of birth is actually um, somewhere around 1 B.C. And he had an elementary, an elementary school education. So that was, that was it for him. No um, upper level education, which I'm not really clear about what the educational opportunities were at that time other than for wealthy people. I know they had more opp opportunities. His occupation, as we talked about, he was a commercial fisherman. Then he became a lead disciple 
and an apostle to the Jews. He started out in Bethsaida, then he moved on to Galilee, and he also lived in Capernaum. All right, his strengths were he was a natural born leader. He was enthusiastic and he was teachable. What, Jacob? I'll get to it. And I'll just read what his accomplishments were, and you guys can summarize any way you want to. All right. He ran a successful fishing business, he walked on water, healed the sick, preached a Holy Ghost revival, he was a brief leader of the first church in Jerusalem, he conducted successful evangelistic ministry, and he was a chronicler for Mark. He was an author and he was a martyr. His weaknesses, he was impetuous, impulsive, overeager brash, vacillating, and undependable. But his life goal, I think we, sh we could all relate to this and we should all strive for it, was to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And his marital status was he was married with a mother-in-law. The mother-in-law lived with him. Pastor Joe said, poor Peter. <laughs> All right, and Jesus references Peter, James does, John and Silas. I'm not sure if I even included that on there, references, yeah. But they all reference him. All right, how do we know that Simon Peter was the leader of the apostolic band? All right, his personality was naturally dominant. Okay, he didn't hesitate to take the lead. From the first meeting, Jesus identifies him as a leader and aptly nicknames him. In every listing of the disciples, his name appears first. And Matthew 10.2 states that he is the protos apostle, P-R-O-T-O-S. All right, he acts as a spokesman for the whole group and he also is a lead actor. Some of this stuff was really interesting. He's addressed more by Jesus and addresses Jesus more than any other disciple. He's complimented more often and he's corrected more harshly by Jesus than all the others. And he is clearly the lead apostle in the first 12 chapters of Acts. Which part? Glad we can be informal here. All right, what are the raw materials that make a leader? You guys know that there's a, a lot of um, debate over nature and nurture. Um, and Peter's really a strong argument for belief that uh, leaders are born with certain gifts and then those gifts kind of have to be shaped into, um, they had to be shaped to make him the leader that he became. 
So he, he had these God-given gifts that were a part of who he was, but um, he needed some things to be developed in him to enable him to become the leader that he ultimately did become. And the raw materials of Peter's temperament that we see um, being developed throughout uh, Peter's life that, that's recorded in the Bible. The first thing that, we, um, that you can see about Peter is he's very inquisitive. Inquisitive. All right, he asks more questions than any of the other disciples combined. Okay, so in Matthew 15, 15, he says, Explain the parable to us. In Luke 12, 41, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? So he wanted to, he wanted to really um, have a clear understanding of what Jesus was saying. Um, he also asked, Hey, how often do we need to forgive? How many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? So he, he really wanted to, he wanted to know how to be a, a good disciple, how to do this thing the right way. And he wanted to know what his reward was going to be. We've left everything to follow you. What, what, will there be, what will there be for us? Matthew 19, 27. He asked about the withered fig tree. And he, he also asked about his death and John's death. I printed, printed these Bible scriptures out in large print because I'm having a hard time reading my Bible. I know none of you have that problem. All right, there are a lot of people that are just content um, to live life with, without, I mean, they don't question things. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. They're comfortable. Um, but leaders typically are not in that category. They're always questioning things. They, wanna, they want things explained to them. They want to understand. They, they want to see beyond the surface. And that's how Peter was. He was just constantly searching for answers. Um, and, and the information that they gain helps them to be able to make decisions that, that end up impacting more than just themselves. So it's good that, you know, people who are, have these leadership tendencies, that they don't just base their decisions you know, it's, it's good for leaders to look beyond themselves and gain as much information so that they can make informed decisions. All right, another necessary ingredient that he had was initiative. Um, he was ambitious. He had a lot of energy. He was the kind of person who makes things happen. You can kind of see this in Pastor Joe if you're around him long. He doesn't sit still long. He doesn't, he doesn't stand still long enough to drink his cup of coffee. He'll go heat his cup of coffee up, come back, do something else. I've got to go heat my cup of coffee up. I mean, he's just kind of like, you know, he just keeps going. And I, I'm, from what I've read, it sounds like Peter was um, very much along the same same lines he was usually uh like we said earlier he was the first to you know ask jesus questions he was the first to act in the garden on christ's behalf remember he cuts off the soldier's ear you know um he was the first to defend the work of the holy spirit and to preach the gospel message on the day of pentecost um and when i was reading through that and thinking about it um there were a lot of soldiers that came into the Garden of Gethsemane to get Jesus that night. Peter didn't care. He didn't stop to think about his own personal safety. He just, he went over there, grabbed his sword, and, you know, he was going to attack. 
And then when you think about the church leaders and their reaction to what happened on the day of Pentecost, um, most of us know they were like, those people are drunk. And Peter was like, no, those people are not drunk. This is, this is real. Um, and and how, I believe that he did that with risk to himself. Um, he could have been arrested with Jesus for assaulting, you know, the soldier. He could have been arrested for speaking out against the church leaders um, on the day of Pentecost. The third element that Peter had was involvement. He was always in the middle of what was going on. He didn't, he didn't just sit back and wait for everybody else to get things done. A true leader will go through life with a cloud of dust around him. And that's why people follow them. Um, you know, you can't follow someone who is distant. You cannot follow someone who's not approachable. Um, and the, uh, when you think about um, when Jesus appeared to the disciples and... Peter's out there walking on the water while the other disciples are thinking, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. So he just, I mean, he was ready to, to jump in. Um, and I know a lot of times, um, you know, everybody knows that Peter denied Jesus three times. Um, but when I was getting ready for tonight, I was thinking about he was really brave. He got as close as he possibly could to Jesus without, I don't know what would have happened to him if he would have gone into, you know, inside with Jesus, but he got as close as he could. And yes, he did deny Jesus three times, but he, he, he tried to stay as close as he could to his Lord. He didn't stand by. All, there was only two disciples that stood by Jesus. All the rest of them ran away scared, but Peter did not. Um, he had some life experiences that helped to shape him into a true leader. And we know that experiences uh, can be hard teachers. Um, he kind of had to be drugged through certain difficulties for him to become the, nest, the leader, the true leader that, that he was destined to become. Um, he learned that crushing defeat and deep humiliation often fall hard on the heels of great victories. Has anybody suffered any uh, deep humiliation? Boy. Any crushing defeats? But those things helped to make Peter the leader that he became. Um, It's, I think just reading through this, I could just relate so much of my own life and, you know, thinking about others around me and, and the difficulties that we go through and, yeah, it really stinks to go through them at the time, but how God uses those things to shape us into the people that he wants us to become. And that's what he did with Peter. And then we will go on and list some of the character qualities of a spiritual leader that were developed in, in him. And the first one is submission. A true leader doesn't just demand submission, but you become an example of submission by the way you submit to legitimate authority. Um, and Jesus demonstrated this to Peter 
in Matthew 17, 24 through 27, when he was talking about paying the temple tax. Um, when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, Yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, From strangers. Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, offend them go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the the fish that comes up first, and when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. So here you have Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, saying, hey, we're going to submit to them. We're going to pay them what they've told us we have to pay them. Jesus didn't have to do that, but he was, he was trying to help Peter see that there are times as a leader when you have to submit. Um, years later, in 1 Peter 2.13, um, Peter actually wrote about what the benefits were of submission. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not yet using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. We have to develop, develop submission. We have to pay our taxes. We need to obey the speed limits. Um, there, we're teaching our kids, we're teaching others around us all the time that we're willing to come under submission just to the laws around us. So, um, Jesus taught Peter, and later in Peter's life, Peter Peter is writing to us, and he's saying, hey, you need to submit as well. The second character quality Peter learned was restraint. Uh, I talked about a little bit ago how uh, Peter got his sword out, and without it, I, I would say without even thinking about it, he just lopped off that ear, um, and Jesus had to rebuke him. Um, he had to learn to control himself. You know, there's, there's things that, there's a lot of things that I might want to do, but it doesn't mean it's going to be beneficial for me. Um, you have to weigh that. You have to learn how to train yourself to wait and think about it and, and, and determine, is this going to be profitable? Is this going to be beneficial? If not, then you need to reel yourself in. Peter had to learn humility. And it can be easy when you're a leader to, um, to get caught up in pride. You know, you've got people that are praising you. Oh, you're doing such a great job. And... Uh, people look up to you and people admire you and it can really lead to an unhealthy self-confidence. And we observed that in Peter. He had a lot of self-confidence and it led him not, on to, not only to act rashly, you know, to, to, to do this thing that he did in, in the garden, but it also led him to speak things that came back to bite him, so to speak. Um, Peter, in no uncertain terms, said, hey, even if everybody else leaves you, I am not going to leave you. Of course, Peter was wrong. You know, 
Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter said, oh, no, never. So I, I, can, I can only imagine the shame and disgrace that he felt after having dishonored Christ by denying him three times. But the Lord used all of that to make Peter humble. And when Peter wrote his first epistles, epistle, he told the leaders in the church to be eager to serve, not to lord over the flock. He said, young men, you need to submit to the older men, and everyone needs to be clothed with humility. And he said, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So you see Peter transformed from this self-confident, prideful disciple who, you know, just flat out says, um, I would never do that to you, Jesus. He, he learns. Peter also learned love. Um... He had to learn that a real leader is someone who serves, not someone who demands to be waited on. Um, a lot of times, people who are leaders, people who have leadership tendencies, they kind of look at people as just objects to get to where they want to go. Um, they're very task-oriented, and they may just overlook you. Um, you and your problems may just be a, a detour that they have to go around um, just to get where they want to go. Peter had to learn um, that people are a part of the process. And Jesus actually, you know, taught Peter... Um, you know, when they were arguing about their positions, Jesus, um, the, the night of the Last Supper, Jesus did what none of them would do. And he got down and he washed their feet. They were so busy talking about who was going to be the first in the kingdom and, and how great they were and that they weren't going to deny Jesus. It wasn't about that at all. It was about loving one another. It was about humbling themselves to one another. And Jesus showed them all about what loving service was by washing their feet. I thought about washing y'all's feet tonight, but I decided not to. Um, and we can tell as Peter matured in 1 Peter 4, 8, he wrote, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. So Peter did learn how to love others. Another important quality that Peter had to learn was compassion. Um, if you've never struggled with something, you really can't relate to people who have struggled. If you never smoked, you probably don't have a lot of compassion for people that do smoke. If you've never had an addiction, you're probably not very compassionate towards people who have an addiction. Um, some people have it all together from the day that they're born and they just can't understand why everybody else around them does not have it all together. Peter had to learn compassion. Um, over in Luke, Luke 22, thirty one through thirty four the Lord said Simon Simon indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat but I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail 
And when you have returned from me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. Um, Peter arrogantly insisted that he would never stumble, but he did. And it really um, crushed his ego and his self-confidence. His faith never failed. But that event for the rest of his life, I bet Peter probably had a lot more compassion for people who made dumb mistakes, who did something that they shouldn't have done. Um, he was much more equipped to deal with others' weaknesses and temptations. Um, and when Peter wrote, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. He was writing that out of his own experience. And it wasn't just, you know, um, it wasn't just theoretical. He, it was his personal experience. And I, I don't know how many times that I've quoted that myself, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, is seeking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I, I mean, I always think of something, you know, really serious, but it, it could just be something really small that um, creeps in and, and, and you trip up on it and then it just leads to something else. I mean, the, when you think of a, a roaring lion, you're thinking about something scary. But how often do we just get caught in little subtle lies or little situations that we shouldn't have allowed ourselves to get in. Um, Peter had to learn courage, not the um, fake kind of courage that he uh, portrayed in the, in the garden, but mature and settled courage, the kind of courage that it would have taken to be able to be crucified upside down on a cross. Um, the kingdom of darkness is set against the kingdom of light. Lies are set against the truth. Satan is set against God and demons are set against the holy purposes of Christ. Therefore, P Peter would face difficulty wherever he went. Christ told him, Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. And what he meant by that was that he was talking about the kind of death that Peter was going to have. Peter's courage would have to endure even to the point of death. Um, and I, I was really moved in Acts when he's defending. It's, it's in Acts chapter 2. Twelve through sixteen. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? And others mocking said, They are full of new wine. 
But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. And he went on to quote um, Joel's prophecy about what it was going to be like on the day of Pentecost. So Peter learned all these lessons and his character was transformed. He became the man that Christ wanted to be. He changed from Simon into the rock. He learned submission, uh, restraint, humility, love, compassion, and courage. And it was just amazing to me um, just reading about Peter's life and, and how he allowed God to transform him into this kind of cocky jerk fisherman into this um, humble, loyal um, leader of the church. And because, you know, he allowed God to work in his life, because he allowed the Holy Spirit to, to guide and direct him, he did become a great leader. It says, um, we, can't, we can't find in the scripture um, anything recorded about Peter's death, but we know from uh, church history, we believe um, that he was crucified in Rome in about A.D. 64. Um, and in, in researching the history, um, it's believed that he was forced to watch his own wife be crucified. And as he watched her being led away, he told her, he called her by name and he said, remember the Lord. And when it was Peter's turn to die, he didn't want to be um, crucified. Uh, he didn't want to be hung on the cross like his savior. He didn't feel like he was worthy to be crucified in that manner. So he asked to be hung upside down. That, you know, we can't prove that by scripture, but that's what research into church history uh, leads us to believe. So, I just want to ask you tonight, um, how pliable are you? How willing are you to allow God to shape you into who he wants you to be? How willing are you to set aside the things that you think are important the things that you want to accomplish and allow God to accomplish through you what he wants to accomplish a lot of us have a plan for our lives how does that plan line up with God's plan? <coughs> and how can we from tonight, what small change can we make in our life to allow God to develop us into the person that he wants to be? What, just a small change. It doesn't have to be something enormous it can be something really subtle maybe being more conscientious about how much time we spend on our devices or maybe being more um, conscientious about how much time we spend reading our Bibles and I'm going to be honest for me, with the, all of the technology, I have not spent as much time with my Bible as, as I used to. And I'll, I'll, I'll say, well, you know, I can, I can read it on here or I can read it on my computer, but it just never seems to happen for me. That's just a personal thing. I think unless I'm holding a book in my hand, it, it just doesn't happen as often for me. Maybe it's somebody that you work with that God is pushing you to be nice to. 
if you guys have worked with some of the people like I have, I know it must be difficult. Oh, at my other job. <laughs> Not Pastor Joe. <laughs> Ooh. And um, as most of you know, I'm starting an internship program at Kettering Hospital on the 5th of June. And I did have a very difficult boss. She was not a very nice person. And when you've worked with someone for three years, when you've prayed for somebody for three years, you hope, you pray that somehow, some way, something you did, some thing that you didn't do, something that you didn't say, that one time that you kept your mouth shut or didn't gossip or whatever, that one day out of 50 that you stayed late and worked for the person, you thought, you hoped that maybe something, some part of that got through to that person. But it didn't. Well, not that you can see with your, your physical eyes or in the natural. It doesn't appear that way. I mean, if I had my way, God, she would have been saved and it would have become a much better work environment, but it didn't. But looking back now, I can tell you that my skin is a lot thicker than it was three years ago when I went to work for her. I can tell you that those same things that she said three years ago didn't do the same things to me by the end that they did at the beginning. I can tell you that God transformed me. I don't know what he did to her, but I know that he worked in me through that time. So sometimes the crummy things that we're going through are the very things that we need to be going through. So I'm just asking you, wherever you're at, Whatever you're dealing with, whatever is interfering with your relationship with God, with your progress, you know, we all want to progress. We want to make progress. Maybe the way that we think about progress should change. I'm just going to close in prayer tonight. Um, did anybody have any prayer concerns that they wanted to share? Okay. Glad everything. I hope I hope that you guys were as challenged and encouraged to learn about Peter's and you know, I know a lot of you guys know this stuff already. It was just neat for me to see it all lined up and put together in kind of a a neat package. Um and I I hope I'll I'll keep uh, Peter's journey close to my heart as I go forward into this week, and I, I hope the same for y'all. But let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for Peter and all that you did through him, Lord, not only in the early church, Lord, but the lives that he's continuing to touch, Lord, even now. The journey that took place in his life, Lord. That's an example to, to us, Lord, of how we need to surrender to you. How the painful, difficult trials of our lives, Lord, shape us to be who you want us to become. Lord, even when we're going through the difficult circumstances, Lord, you're there with us. Lord, Help us to rely on that knowledge as we go forward into our jobs, into school this week, into caring for our homes, Lord, whatever it is that we do. I pray, Lord, that you would help all of us to remember that we're on a journey, that this is not going to last forever, and that you're with us as we go through it. Lord, I pray um, for just... A special touch, Lord, as I begin this new journey in my life. And 
I'm just so thankful for this church family that you've brought us to and that we can laugh and have fun together, Lord, and we can learn together. I thank you for a pastor who's willing to go out and serve in our community, Father. Lord God, we just ask for strength. We ask for provision for he and Pam, Lord. Lord God, we just ask that, that you would bless them in unimaginable, unimaginable ways, Lord, as they serve others, as they do for others, as they submit themselves to your will, Lord God. Father, bless all of those who put forth such a great effort to make all of our services happen, Lord. Craig and Lance, uh, Rob, all of those that sing or play instruments on the worship team, Lord. Father, just pray blessings upon them. Lord, uh, for those who teach classes, for those who take out trash, for those who set out the donuts, for those who clean up, for those who cut the grass, for those who do the landscaping, Lord. Father, we're just so incredibly blessed with so many who are willing to serve, Lord. Father, would you touch each of them this week? In your precious and holy name, amen.